The space shuttle Columbia will come home tomorrow. Space officials have ordered the shuttle to land at Edwards Air Force Base, California tomorrow at 1.22 p.m. local time. The five-day mission had to be shortened because of problems with generating power on the spacecraft. More from Mutual's Jim Slade. The decision to end the flight prematurely marks only the third time NASA managers have done that. The first was on Gemini 8 in 1966 when astronauts David Scott and Neil Armstrong made an emergency landing after a steering engine stuck and spun them out of control. The second time, Apollo 13 in 1970 when the spacecraft blew up on the way to the moon and had to land after a torturous four-day flight back to Earth. In today's case, there is no present danger. The decision was made because of mission rules which require three operating electric generators. Columbia has only two at present. Jim Slade, Mutual News, the Kennedy Space Center. Before they come back to Earth, astronauts Joe Engel and Richard Truly are cramming in as many experiments as they can. They've tested the huge mechanical arm that one day will deposit and retrieve satellites in space. And they've taken pictures of thunderstorms over Australia. This is news from Mutual Radio. John Bascom reporting. CBS News. Its mission cut in half by a faulty fuel cell. The shuttle Columbia is due to land tomorrow afternoon. I'm Bill Lynch, reporting on the CBS radio network. Even though it's now called a minimum mission, NASA officials say Columbia's major experiments will be completed. The next big event for astronauts Joe Engel and Richard Truly is their dead stick landing on the California desert. David Dow is standing by at Edwards Air Force Base. The men and machines of the recovery team are ready for the landing here of Shuttle 2. The question mark is the weather. Right now, a high overcast covers this desert air base. The forecast is for improvement tonight, but still potentially marginal conditions tomorrow. NASA ground rules call for the cloud cover to be 50% or less. Forecasters now predict 30 to 60 percent cover. There's also some chance of rain showers in the area tonight. Any heavy rain on the clay lake bed could turn its surface to slime and cancel all landings for several days. And any rain at all when Columbia actually re-enters the Earth's atmosphere tomorrow would, according to the rules, send the spacecraft to an alternate site, possibly White Sands, New Mexico, where the weather is reported good. David Dow, CBS News, Edwards Air Force Base, California. Tonight, President Reagan will visit the Johnson Space Center in Houston and talk with the disappointed astronauts. Late word from Pentagon sources, President Reagan has decided not to extend the career of Admiral Hyman Rickover, the 81-year-old father of the nuclear submarine. Rickover had told CBS he would not resign voluntarily. More news after this. officials have decided to cut short the mission of the space shuttle Columbia and bring it home tomorrow. Mutual's Jim Slade reports from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The astronauts are in no... ...healthy. Landing with only two electric generators presents no problem for the spacecraft systems, but landing with one would be very slow and difficult. Touchdown is expected at 422 Eastern Time tomorrow afternoon at Edwards Air Force Base, California. Jim Slade, Mutual News, the Kennedy Space Center. CBS News. President Reagan is flying to Houston at this hour for a speech to Texas Republicans and for a visit to the Johnson Control Center to talk to the orbiting shuttle astronauts by radio this evening. I'm Douglas Edwards reporting on the CBS radio network. Because of the risk posed by failure of a fuel cell generator, astronauts Joe Engel and Richard Truly have been ordered to return to Earth late tomorrow afternoon. The space shuttle Columbia is now scheduled to come in for a gliding landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California at 4.22 p.m. Eastern Time on Saturday. Christopher Kraft, director of the Johnson Space Center, says he and other project officials have taken the safest option to cut the flight short. We think it's the prudent thing to do uh, at this point in our test program. Uh, we think we can really get everything out of the mission that we have planned uh, with, the, with the exception of time. So we just felt that from a more prudent position, uh, we, had, we had thought it out very carefully uh, pre-flight, but uh, that was the best thing for us to do. As the President flies aboard Air Force One toward Houston, astronauts Richard Truly and Joe Engel are soaring above Earth. 
preparing for their early landing tomorrow. NASA officials announced today that the planned to two days. Glenn Lunny, the manager of the space shuttle program, said the mission has already accomplished most of its major objectives. We began to ask ourselves, uh, is there enough to be gained by continuing the flight uh, that would warrant putting ourselves in a position where subsequent difficulties could either compromise our high priority objectives on entry or perhaps even find ourselves in a further reduced power plant condition. We concluded the answer to those questions uh, was such that we ought to plan to re-enter on, uh, on the plan that we have for tomorrow and not take any subsequent risk that the objectives would be compromised or that subsequent failures would reduce the flying capability of the machine. The shuttle is scheduled now to land on Rogers Dry Lake in California at 1.22 p.m. Pacific Time on Saturday. More news in a minute. This is The World Tonight. Good evening, I'm Douglas Edwards, CBS News. First, bad news. Our plan is that uh, we're running a minimum mission and you'll be coming in tomorrow. Uh, boy, I'll tell you what, you're garbled and unreadable there, Sally. Okay, you get to hear the bad news one more time then. We're running a minimum mission and you'll be coming in tomorrow. Oh, uh, okay, that's not so good. Think of it that you got all of the good OSTA data and all the RMS data and you just did too good a job. We're going to bring you in early. <laughs> Okay. That's the way Joe Engel and Richard Truly got the news today as they orbited the Earth in the Columbia Space Shuttle. In effect, come home early, boys. We want to play it safe. More on this from Steve Young at the Johnson Space Center. Today's decision to trim the shuttle flight by more than half is only the third time that a U.S. manned space flight has been cut short while in progress. But at a news conference here, the director of the Johnson Space Center, Dr. Christopher Kraft, denied that the decision was due to alarm on the part of officials over the failure of one of the shuttle's three fuel cells. We think it's the prudent thing to do uh, at this point in our test program. Uh, we think we can really get everything out of the mission that we have planned uh, with, the ex with the exception of time. Another member of Top Brass, shuttle program manager Dr. Glenn Lunny, said we've achieved 90% of what we flew for. All five experiments gathered at least some data, and of greatest importance, most of the planned tests were conducted on a new piece of gear, shuttle's 50-foot-long arm. A five-day mission will end in just over two, but even so, President Reagan flew to mission control to offer his congratulations tonight. Steve Young, CBS News, Johnson Space Center, Houston. The Columbia is scheduled to land at 4.22 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow at the Edwards Air Force Base in California, and we go there for a report from David Dow. The weather won't likely be perfect for tomorrow's shuttle landing at Edwards Air Force Base. The forecast calls for marginal landing conditions, with perhaps half or more of the sky covered with high clouds. But NASA officials seem confident the weather will be adequate for return of the world's first reused spacecraft. Their main concern, that Orbiter Commander Joe Engel be able to see at least some of the landmarks en route to his landing here. That's desirable, though not totally necessary. The shuttle is linked to the ground with a special automatic landing system, which will be used to within about 40 seconds of touchdown. In fact, one official said Columbia could be landed in zero-zero conditions, total cloud cover. If controllers did decide not to take a chance on Edwards' weather, they could divert Columbia to White Sands, New Mexico, simply by delaying the spacecraft's deorbit burn by two minutes, the operation that will start Columbia back toward Earth. David Dow, CBS News, Edwards Air Force Base, California. More news after this. It's 11 o'clock. From ABC News, I'm Paul Altmaier. Astronauts Joe Engel and Richard Truly have wrapped up their experiments aboard the space shuttle Columbia. NASA officials say that the astronauts will return to Earth Saturday with the mission's objectives 90% complete. The second flight of the Columbia was cut by more than a half because of the failure of an electrical generator. If everything goes according to plan, astronauts Engel and Truly will bring their spacecraft back to Earth Saturday afternoon at Edwards Air Force Base in California. From the landing site, correspondent John Lyons has more. Everything is ready here for Columbia's return, only the weather is still in doubt.
predicted to be cloudy with light, gusty winds. But those winds are expected to be blowing directly down the runway. No problem for Columbia. If the weather worsens with rain in the area or stiffer winds, Columbia could come down about 90 minutes later than now scheduled by simply going around the world one more time. If NASA delays the landing beyond that, Columbia would be out of range and would be unable to land at Edwards until Sunday. The crew could land Columbia at several other fields across the country, but NASA really wants to bring it here. John Lyons, ABC News at Edwards Air Force Base, California. I'll have more after this. News. President Reagan talked by radio from Houston's Mission Control Friday night. The message beamed up to astronauts Richard Trudy and Joe Engel aboard the space shuttle Columbia. Joe, Dick, this is Ronald Reagan. Hello, Mr. President. Hello. I just, uh, I wanted to make a request. Uh, I just wondered if when you go over Washington before you were landing at Edwards Air Force Base, could you pick me up and take me out? I haven't been to California since last August. <laughs> the Columbia is due to land Saturday afternoon, three days early, because of a malfunctioning fuel cell. Coverage of the landing begins at 4.15 p.m. Eastern Time over many of these mutual stations. The president was in Houston for a GOP fundraiser. At the dinner, Mr. Reagan said more spending cuts were in order, but he promised not to increase taxes. The space shuttle Columbia comes home today, but weather could complicate things. Hundreds of U.S. paratroopers land outside Cairo on maneuvers, and today's Irish troubles include an assassination and a bombing. Good morning. This is Bill Lynch with the CBS World News Roundup, filling in today for Neil Strasser. The flight of the shuttle Columbia is in its final hours, its mission abbreviated by a bad fuel cell, and its two-man crew disappointed at not getting to complete their five-day mission. Reed Collins has the latest from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Joe Henry Engel and Richard Truly were awakened early with the playing of Columbia the Jam of the Ocean by what is called the Flight Operations Contraband. The morning amenities were brief as they prepared to go to work. Good morning, Jerry. How are you doing this morning? Hey, we're doing real fine. How are y'all? Doing super. Uh, when you get a chance, you probably know that we've got a a lot of teleprinter messages that have come up over the night. Now, there's some information that you're going to need here in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Roger, Jim. Uh, even as you speak, uh, we're looking at 35 Alpha and trying to mark it into our camp. And so the astronauts began fine-tuning the reentry checklist in preparation for the deorbit burn, which will send them plummeting toward Earth from their perch 140 nautical miles up. They'll be testing the shuttle's flight capability more severely on this trip down. They may even change runways at Edwards Air Force Base in order to get a crosswind, the bane of most landing amateur pilots. Reed Collins, CBS News at the Johnson Space Center. The big question mark for this afternoon's landing is the weather, and at the moment, officials are watching the skies nervously. David Dow reports from Edwards Air Force Base in California. The weather for Columbia's landing at Edwards Air Force Base is, as one NASA spokesman put it, on the borderline. The big concern, as it has been since yesterday, clouds. They're expected to cover 60 to 70 percent of this high desert at the scheduled touchdown time. That is hardly perfect by NASA standards, which call for landings with 50 percent or less cloud cover. But the weather forecast for the prime backup site, White Sands, New Mexico, isn't much better. And since only a skeleton recovery crew is on duty at White Sands, NASA controllers would like, if at all possible, to bring Columbia in here. They'll likely hold off their decision until after two weather reconnaissance flights and a NASA jet later this morning by John Young, the first astronaut to land a shuttle orbiter here. If he says go, the decision will likely be go for a 1.22 p.m. Pacific time landing at Edwards Air Force Base. David Dow, CBS News, Lancaster, California. There was a party in San Francisco last night to celebrate the historic and harrowing Pacific flight of the Balloon Double Eagle Five. 
The four crew members announced that after making repairs to the balloon and its gondola, they'll make a return trip to Japan in several months. Their craft is still stranded in the remote mountains north of San Francisco. Here are... Board the Columbia has forced NASA officials to bring the space shuttle back to Earth ahead of schedule this afternoon. Landing is set for 4.22 p.m. Eastern Time at Edwards Air Force Base, California. But as Mutual's Jim Slade notes, the weather there is not good and could prompt a delay. With weather the main question at this point, a lot of decisions have to be made about today's landing. One of the groups helping to decide will be the people flying the chase planes, the planes which escort the shuttle down during the last leg of its approach. They will circle the landing area for some time before landing begins, evaluating by eye the conditions that exist, and will make recommendations based on what they see and how they feel. Crewmen on the chase planes are all astronauts, making astronaut decisions. What they say carries significant weight with the people on the ground. Jim Slade, Mutual News, the Kennedy Space Center. Coverage of the landing of Columbia will be carried live over most of these mutual stations, starting at 4.15 Eastern Time. This is news from Mutual Radio. Fred Lowry reporting. Predicted four runoff elections will draw all night long, making preparations to bring the space shuttle Columbia home today. And we're going to go down to the Johnson Space Center right now for a live update from KPRH's Wayne Gocifino. Lee, it was another restful night for the shuttle astronauts once Commander Ingle had replaced a burnt-out TV monitoring screen that displays the commander's trajectory and landing data. And once again this morning, the wake-up call for mission control came in the form of another episode of Pigs in Space. Well, Link, today is the day for the Columbia to end its mission. I'm going to miss you. It was nice looking for me. Ah, oh, in a little while, we'll be re-entering the atmosphere of Mother Earth. Well, I hope they've solved their problems with those heat tiles. At least they've got tiles. Yeah, we got shingles. Who ever heard of putting shingles on a spaceship? It looks silly. I think it's quaint. They look like a floating hunting lodge. You'd love it, Joe Henry. Anyway, we wish the Columbia a happy landing. We will be staying here, in the outer reaches of space. Our mission is not complete. Tell them why our mission is not complete. Yeah, tell them why we're staying in space. Just because we don't know how to get down. Oh, Jack, which button do you push? Well, it certainly isn't the cute little red one. And so if I did a barrel roll to final, would that work? Oh, 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 CBS News. NASA officials and Columbia astronauts Joe Engel and Richard Truly are keeping a sharp weather eye. I'm Bill Lynch reporting on the CBS radio network. Broken clouds and wind gusts up to 28 miles an hour are reported in the California desert where the shuttle Columbia is due to land in just over six hours. If those conditions hold, NASA officials say the weather will be within limits for a safe landing. If the clouds and winds get much worse, they may have to divert the orbiter to White Sands, New Mexico. But conditions there are reported just marginally better. Severe winds and rains have been lashing the nation's northwest and southeast coastlines. Along Northern California's coastal highway, a dozen five-foot-thick redwood trees were knocked over by wind gusts up to 100 miles an hour. Some abandoned Oregon residents fled their homes when winds knocked over oil and gas tanks. I'm this afternoon. I think it looks good. California landing this afternoon. Mutual correspondent Jim Slade reports. Everything's proceeding toward a landing at Edwards Air Force Base at 422 Eastern Time this afternoon. Weathermen are keeping an eye cocked to the weather. Clouds are the main question today, with overhead coverage at the base now listed at about 50% or more. The final judgment on the weather there will be made by astronauts flying observation planes. Because other facilities are not considered desirable, Edwards boils down to about the only choice for landing today. Its wide open spaces offer the safest place for the experimental space plane to make a touchdown in any circumstance. 
Jim Slade, Mutual News, the Kennedy Space Center. Second mission of the Space Shuttle Columbia. The weather still threatens to make a landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California a little rough. Good morning. This is Rob Armstrong reporting on the CBS radio network. David Dow is at Edwards Air Force Base and has the latest. The weather still isn't cooperating for today's touchdown at Edwards Air Force Base. At this moment, a high overcast nearly covers the Columbia landing site, and the forecast for 1.22 p.m. Pacific time when touchdown is scheduled is much better. One official suggesting that astronauts Engel and Truly might be given a wave off for another orbit around the Earth, hoping for a break in the weather. If conditions aren't the alternate landing site is White Sands, New Mexico, where weather conditions are much better. Only a if Columbia comes in here, as still seems likely, there is talk of pushing runway to give the astronauts and the shuttle some experience with possible land. Since Thursday, rough seas off the coast of Florida prevented divers from recovering Columbia's two rocket booster casings from the Atlantic. One was finally snagged this morning, and officials say they expect the other to be recovered this afternoon.
NASA officials say they are optimistic the Space Shuttle Columbia will land on schedule this afternoon at Edwards Air Force Base in California. At this time, a high cloud layer covers the landing site, but astronaut John Young this morning reported from a training plane over Edwards Air Force Base that conditions will improve for the shuttle landing scheduled at 422 this afternoon. There's a layer right now that uh, starts at 30,000 feet, goes to 35,000 feet. It's overcast, but you can see through it, and it's going to blow out of here and be clear because it's uh, over in the west, it's clear. NASA officials say clouds are a problem because ice crystals could damage the red-hot insulating tiles on the space shuttle. At this time, shuttle astronauts Joe Engel and Richard Cooley are still trying to completely close the shuttle's bay doors and they're getting into their pressurized spacesuits for re-entry. Mutual's live coverage of this afternoon's shuttle landing will begin at 4.15 Eastern Time. This is news from Mutual Radio, Bill Torrey reporting. CBS News, as the second mission of the Space Shuttle Columbia nears its premature end, officials are still keeping a wary eye on the weather at Edwards Air Force Base in California. This is Rob Armstrong reporting on the CBS Radio Network. A faulty fuel cell aboard the Space Shuttle is forcing the mission to end almost three days early. The bad weather at both the Columbia's primary and backup landing sites is causing concern. David Dow has the latest from Edwards Air Force Base. The weather watch continues at Edwards Air Force Base beneath mostly cloudy skies and at times gusty winds. Less than an hour ago, astronaut John Young completed another weather reconnaissance run in a NASA jet and reported that both of Columbia's possible runways were okay for landing. He indicated, though, that wind conditions at the end of the prime runway, running to the southwest, might require a slight change in flight plan, in which shuttle commander Joe Engel would control the shuttle manually rather than relying on the automatic landing system. If the winds stay where they are right now, Engel may have the honor of trying the shuttle's first crosswind landing, bringing the orbiter into a runway crossing the prime landing strip at a nearly right angle. The decision to do that has still not been made, though, pending Young's final reconnaissance run about an hour before the scheduled deorbit of Columbia. David Dow, CBS News, Edwards Air Force Base, California. Meanwhile, the astronauts, Joe Engel and Richard Cooley, are making final preparations aboard the Columbia to return to Earth. This was part of a conversation between Shuttle Control and Richard Cooley a short while ago as the shuttle's huge cargo bay doors were being closed. The uh, starboard uh, door is uh, in the proximity to the closed position, and while we got AOS, why don't I just uh, tell you where it is, okay? That sounds good. If the weather cooperates, the Space Shuttle Columbia will touch down at Edwards Air Force Base in California a little more than three hours from now. The landing of Columbia will be broadcast live over many of these CBS radio network stations. More news in one minute. Right now, the weather word is go for a landing at runway 15 at Edwards Air Force Base just about three hours and 15 minutes from now. Shuttle astronaut John Young has taken a training aircraft up, has looked at the weather, and has given the okay for now. They'll take another shot at it uh, slightly before we go into our deorbit burn. There is a chance that the weather at Edwards is bad, that the shuttle could land at an alternative site, such as Northrop Field, but Flight Director Chuck Lewis says there are some reasons uh, they don't want to land there. The problem, of course, uh, is turnaround time. There is not enough equipment at the north of field, and uh, they want to go at Edwards, and right now it's looking very well. No problems with the shuttlecraft right now, Mike. Uh, we had a few little minor problems with some instruments earlier today, but things looking very well right now. We're right now in orbit 35, and it'll be during orbit 36, the end of 36, that we'll begin the deorbit burn. And, of course, we'll be bringing you live coverage of the key points of the landing and the return of Columbia. I'm Wayne Dolce reporting live from the Johnson Space Center, KTRH News.
Now there's less than two and a half hours remaining in the second flight of Columbia. I'm Rick James, American Contemporary Radio. Mission Control in Houston is gearing up to guide the astronauts out of orbit and at Edwards Air Force Base in California. They're ready for the soft touchdown of the shuttle. Let's get live reports from both places first to Edwards Air Force Base and ABC's John Lyons. Rick, the space fates may be smiling on the shuttle program again. NASA is bringing this spaceship down early because of a problem, but it looks like this shot of bad fortune may get them a chance for a test that was not scheduled for this flight, but is considered one of the most important tests of the shuttle test program. The wind and the weather are conspiring to give Columbia a chance at a crosswind landing, a chance to see how the orbiter flies and approach and landing with the wind gusting from the side. This is very important information before they make, start making landings at the Kennedy Space Center's 300-foot-wide runway. And now at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Bob Walker. It's been very quiet, John Lyons, on the air-to-ground loops inside Mission Control, but that doesn't mean the astronauts haven't been busy. They've been going down a long checklist of landing procedures, preceded by the closing of the payload bay doors and into their special pressurized flight suits, the ones they wore on launch day. The Columbia, now in orbit 35, it's over the Indian Ocean, heading for the southern tip of Australia. Rick James. Thank you, gentlemen. ABC's John Lyons at Edwards Air Force Base in California and correspondent Bob Walker at Mission Control in Houston. The Pacific Northwest is battered by more high winds. That story coming up. two hours, the astronauts aboard the space shuttle Columbia are expected to bring the ship back into the Earth's atmosphere and then attempt to land the shuttle at California's Edwards Air Force Base. I'm Judy Muller, reporting on the CBS Radio Network. It would be the first time a manned spacecraft has returned to Earth a second time, demonstrating the ship's ability to shuttle to and from space. David Dow is at the landing site and has this report. It is windbreaker weather on this desert lake bed, where in a little less than two and a half hours, Columbia is scheduled to land after two days, six hours, and 12 minutes in space. At this moment, astronaut John Young is making his final run in an NASA jet to check the weather and the suitability for a crosswind landing. Here on the lake bed, several hundred yards from the planned touchdown point, the southwest winds are blowing briskly in 60-degree temperatures. Overhead, a broken cloud cover with large swaths of blue where Columbia will make its final turn before landing here. Hundreds of persons are bracing the winds in the VIP area just behind us, and across the lake bed, several miles away, officials are expecting a crowd of 100,000 or so other spectators. For this, the first landing of a reused American spacecraft. David Dow, CBS News, Edwards Air Force Base, California. More CBS News in a minute. And a half, the Columbia should be home. I'm Freddie Rodriguez, American Contemporary Radio. NASA officials say everything is going smoothly aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia and at Edwards Air Force Base in California, where the shuttle is to touch down this afternoon. They are keeping an eye on the weather, though. ABC's Vic Ratner is standing by live at Edwards with the latest. Vic? Freddie, the weather here is not great, but it's good enough for the Columbia to come down. The commander of the first shuttle flight, John Young, is out right now in a shuttle training aircraft practicing approaches the same kind that Columbia will fly. And Young has been reporting the weather he finds back to the Mission Control Center, which has been telling the crew it's okay to come on in as scheduled, firing the rocket for deorbit in about half an hour. At Mission Control, here's Bob Walker. And Vic Ratner, astronauts Joe England and Dick Truly aboard the Columbia are in their final orbit before landing. They've just passed over the southeastern United States. That'll be their last look at the USA before they eyeball the California coast on landing about an hour and 28 minutes from now. Still relatively quiet in air-to-ground communications as they continue to go down their lengthy pre-landing checklist. Flight controllers and mission control, very relaxed and very confident. Ready? Thank you, Bob. Bob Walker of ABC at the Johnson Space Center in Houston and ABC's Vic Ratner at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Weather problems have been plaguing much of the rest of the nation, though. That story coming up. The weather appears to be improving at Edwards Air Force Base in California. The space shuttle Columbia is scheduled to touch down there a little less than an hour and a half from now. 
This is Rob Armstrong reporting on the CBS radio network. The abbreviated mission of the reusable space shuttle is scheduled to end on the hard California desert floor. The mission cut short by almost three days because of a faulty fuel cell. Reed Collins at the Johnson Space Center in Houston takes a look at what the next 81 minutes hold for astronauts Engel and Truly. In 23 minutes, they'll fire the deorbit thrusters over the Indian Ocean and begin to fall halfway around the world. That is to end at Edwards Air Force Base in a tricky crosswind landing on runway 16. For 16 minutes as they fall through the atmosphere, they'll be blacked out from all communication with the ground. The Columbia bearing heat loads of 2,000 degrees or more. Through this period, they'll move the stick, testing the craft's stability and control system. They'll roll the orbiter, rocking from wing to wing. They'll leave the blackout some 570 miles from Edwards at an altitude of just 34 miles, but still streaking across the coast of California at 8,500 miles an hour. And just 11 minutes later, Engel should be flaring out over the runway, touching down on the desert floor and home. That, at least, is the plan. Reed Collins, CBS News, Johnson Space Center. More on the return of Columbia when CBS News continues. Despite disappointment over ending the second mission of the space shuttle Columbia early, there's an air of excitement at Edwards Air Force Base in California. David Dow is there and files this report. The recovery team is in place. The convoy of 18 vehicles now standing by several hundred yards from where Columbia is scheduled to roll to a stop standing by to purge it of any toxic or explosive gases it may collect en route to a landing on this desert lake bed. And the people are here too. Latest Air Force estimates indicate that 150,000 spectators have already assembled on the lake bed edge to watch the second landing of Columbia. As it stands now, it will be the first crosswind landing for a shuttle and its crew. John Young, the first astronaut to have landed in orbiter here, making several practice passes on runway 15 and pronouncing it fit for landing. Young also reported that the cloud cover is diminished, that all visual checkpoints on route to the runway are visible from the air. On the ground, the visibility is almost unlimited. The winds have risked 15 miles an hour, and the atmosphere here expectant. David Dow, CBS News, Edwards Air Force Base, California. The second... Lee, less than a minute now from the deorbit burn of the Space Shuttle Columbia in space now for a little more than two days and four hours or so. The deorbit ignition coming up in 42 seconds. Uh, at that point, uh, the Space Shuttle Columbia will start uh, a, a flip maneuver. Right now it's upside down. It will turn itself upright and begin its flip maneuver and then shortly after enter a blackout period for a period of about 20 minutes or so, a period of about uh, 28 miles. And during that period, the tiles will be taking the rough heat uh, as they try to enter the atmosphere, uh, temperature of up to 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. 15 degrees, 15 seconds away from the deorbit ignition period, the Columbia will flip if all goes right. Of course, NASA may not know because we're in a loss of signal right now. You heard it from Mission Control. The Space Shuttle Columbia now on its way home and has made, apparently, the deorbit maneuver. And now I'm Wayne Dolcefino, live from the Johnson Space Center, back to the football game. 
Reed Collins, CBS News at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And less than two minutes ago, over the Indian Ocean, Engel and Truly were scheduled to have fired the onboard rocket system that slows them enough to bring them back to Earth. They're out of communication with any ground stations now, so we don't know just yet how that went. But we should be hearing in about four minutes when they come within range of the Yargity tracking station in Australia. Their target is halfway around the world, Edwards Air Force Base, where my colleague David Dow is standing by. And David, what's it like at Edwards less than one hour from landing? Well, Reed, there is the same era of expectancy that was here for the landing of Shuttle 1 last spring. Uh, Air Force officials are estimating that more than 150,000 people are gathered around the lake bed edge here to watch the landing of Shuttle 2. And just a few minutes ago, there was a change in signals with regards to the landing. All morning, there had been talk that this would be the first crosswind landing by Columbia, by any uh, shuttle orbiter. But just a few minutes ago, uh, astronaut John Young made his final pass down runway 15, said that the winds seemed to be the same according to his instruments. That's 210 degrees, or a southwest wind, blowing at 12 knots, but he said it seems a lot greater than that to me, and a decision was made finally to bring the uh, orbiter in on the same runway that it used last spring. In other words, to bring it uh, into the prevailing winds blowing across this desert uh, lake bed here. Again, there's an era of expectancy, the same trappings as last, last spring's landing, the weather improving, still a bit nippy, still windy, but apparently, according to everyone, ready for a landing here. What we think happened was that they slowed the craft by about, oh, 215 miles an hour. And at 16,500 miles an hour, that's just enough to do it. Just enough to put the craft, if nothing else happened and the atmosphere did not intervene, some two miles below the Earth once it had circled halfway around the Earth. That, of course, they don't plan to do because they will enter the atmosphere, the sensible portions of it, a little later on in the flight, some 400,000 feet over the Pacific, that will begin to happen. And at that point in the sky, 400,000 feet up and just east of Guam, they'll begin hitting the first molecules of the atmosphere. Then they'll be enveloped in a hail of ionized air through which no communication can pass. This is the famed blackout period. Estimated time of it, 16 minutes. They, of course, do not physically black out, but they're blacked out from any communication with the ground station on Earth. When they get out of it after the 16 minutes fall time, they're still 5,000 miles from Edwards Air Force Base. They've headed around, of course, and have been flying front first since the deorbit burn, which we estimate took place some four minutes ago. They'll leave the blackout some 572 miles from Edwards. They will have fallen to an altitude of 34 miles by this time. They're still traveling some 8,500 miles an hour, that's hypersonic speed, when they cross the coast of California. And then they begin to look for their landing point, and it's only a matter of minutes before they're scheduled to be on the ground on runway 23 at Edwards Air Force Base up in the high, dry Mojave Desert. Where John Young, as my colleague David Dow told you, has been shooting landings. He's been up to 37,000 feet, where the wind's blowing, oh, at 90 miles an hour. He's been down on the ground where it's gusting too much at runway 15 for the planned cross-wind landing, something private pilots don't particularly like, but test pilots really wanted to try on this second flight of the Columbia. But it's going to come in, as did the first flight of the shuttle, in on the long runway 23, more than five miles of it, mostly just impacted sand out there. Plenty of latitude and plenty of space in which to make a mistake if you care to make a mistake in experimental space flight. So that's the plan. They, they fiddled with the idea of runway 15 all morning. In fact, they designated 15 at one time. In fact, he even got his headings sent up to him and was told it would be 15. But as they uh, went out of sight over Botswana, the decision was made on the ground not to try 15, to come in on the more standard runway 23 which will head the shuttle out over the desert, around Boron, and then back toward David Dow. He'll be able to watch it coming almost head-on toward him when he catches sight of it at first. The chase planes, the T-38 
training planes are in the air now, and they'll be awaiting the rendezvous in near space over the Mojave, where they'll try to get a first visual look at Angle and truly flying along. Angle is the commander, and he's the pilot who will land the craft. And we're going to join now Mission Control, the voice of Jack Riley, who will tell us what's happening. Acquisition in uh, about 40 seconds. We'll stand by. We'll stand by with him, too. We're waiting for that uh, base down at Yargadi, which is on the western reach of Australia, to pick up some signal and immediately get a deorbit burn status report from the astronauts. They uh, will be heading around nose first now. They fired at tail end first and upside down. They want to hit the atmosphere, of course, in the manner of a flying airplane, nose up, and uh, take the first beginning of what may be some 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit of heat. Coming in, they're going to be rolling the craft around, trying to upset its balance, trying to test what the flight dynamics of a plane are at 16,000 miles an hour. Over. Okay, Houston, I read you loud and clear, and the burn was good. Okay, that's Super Joe. Uh, one uh, change to the plan, uh, John's last weather flight indicated that our crosswind uh, might be a little bit high, so we're going to ask you to uh, reselect the runway 23, your prime runway, and we'll uh, make a uh, landing on 23. Over. That's affirmative. Runway 23. Over. And they're busy patching that in on their pad, on their suits, and deciding, well, we don't get the crosswind landing experience this time. But uh, as Young reported, down on the ground, right on the runway, flat, the wind was gusty and was heavy and was uh, a little more than even he would have Joe Henry, as he calls Mr. Engel, try. Not on the second flight, maybe the third. Five minutes remaining in the pass. How do you read, over? Okay, read your left clear. Now, Rick, you did fade out. I understand uh, you want us to retarget to 2-3? That's affirmative. The uh, surface winds are uh, a little bit too much for the crosswind. Uh, one in, one uh, note on that, the uh, evaluation of the auto maneuver around the hack would result in a 1.6 G turn. However, we're still uh, recommending a CSS on the hack. And that is the indication. He's talking about the hack. That's the um, heading acquisition circle out there around which they'll go and get their heading coming back into the runway, which is 2-3. And we have about 50 minutes until that time of landing, until the approach and landing at Edwards Air Force Base. The deorbit burn has been successfully completed. They're committed now to come down. This is Reed Collins, CBS News at the Johnson Space Center. People at Mission Control in Houston and see if we can pick up some of their conversations uh, with the astronauts as the spacecraft re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, undergoes that tremendous force and heat uh, that puts the tiles to the maximum test on uh, the bottom of the spacecraft. 20 seconds, LOS. Uh, can you confirm whether the OEX recorder was configured uh, prior to seat ingress? Uh, That's the voice of mission control. Uh, I believe it was, Rick. The voice okay, of astronaut joining. We'll see you out of blackout and looking forward to seeing you there. 20 seconds to blackout time. Okay, Rick, and uh, we're pretty sure that the OEX recorder is on. Okay, thank you, Joe. See you in about uh, 20 minutes. Okay. Joe Engel, the flight commander, in communication with the mission control computer. Configure LOS. Okay, Rick, we're beginning to enter the blackout period. Thirty-three minutes until landing. We're this getting the back up here. Guam has lost of signal. Columbia now 36 seconds away from hearing the Earth's atmosphere. And 32 minutes, 47 seconds away from landing at Edwards Air Force Base. We're uh, 20 and a half minutes away from uh, being able to uh, talk to the crew again. All three uh, auxiliary 
star units up and running, looking good. That's Columbia uh, passed out of range in Guam. The power level uh, looked great. The guidance officer said he saw runway 23 selected uh, into the uh, CRT on the instrument panel. You can see perhaps in our animation uh, that is an animated version. We've had an update what on the uh, uh, men of courage and talent of the cockpit of Columbia are going through at this moment. The interface as remained the same. In uh, these seconds, they are re entering the Earth's atmosphere. That, uh, uh, well, to me, almost fantastic today. people. soon be over after a number of intricate maneuvers in the past hour to bring it from Earth orbit to a landing on Earth. We have live reports from the Johnson Space Center in Houston and the landing site in California. First to Mission Control and ABC's George Engel. George? Rick, that's a very hot space shuttle up there right now. It's building up temperatures that will go as high as about 2,700 degrees on the nose. And right now, they're just waiting for the acquisition of signal once again that says they've come through this blackout period of hot entry into Earth's atmosphere, and that'll be about 15 and a half minutes from now. All of the flight controllers here in the mission control room on their feet, watching the scopes, waiting. There's not very much they can do. There's not anything anybody can do now except wait for it to come out of this envelope of plasma that keeps it quiet up there. Uh, let's check out on where it's going to be landing at Edwards Air Force Base. Here's John Lyons. George, here at Edwards Air Force Base, we're about 26 and a half minutes away from seeing Columbia come overhead at about 55,000 feet. Those clouds that we've been talking to you about for the past couple of days seem to be clearing out. Almost no cloud cover in the direction that the Columbia will be flying. The wind, however, has picked up. As a result of that, they will not be getting the opportunity to land in a crosswind as they have hoped. They'll be landing on runway 23 to the southwest. And uh, right now, the convoy of vehicles that will go out to meet Columbia after she lands is in position. The chase planes are in the sky. Everything is ready. Columbia is coming home. And 100,000 people here are looking to the sky to see her. Rick? Thank you, gentlemen. ABC's George Engel at Mission Control and John Lyons at Edwards Air Force Base. Organized labor is calling for a big nationwide boycott. That story coming up. Still in the blackout, that is unable to communicate with the ground, but hurtling along toward the coast of California, which they should reach in a short time. Their target area, runway 23 at Edwards Air Force Base. My colleague David Dow is there. David, what's the scene? Well, the scene is, uh, again, one of expectancy here. The camera, the rows of cameramen to my left extend for at least 300 yards, all poised out on that runway 23 where the such wonderful pictures were taken before. The weather continues to improve here, Reed. The sky now much more blue than cloudy. The winds, however, are brisk. If anything, they have picked up in the last hour. The decision to abandon the crosswind landing perhaps uh, looking better and better as we go. Reed? Better as we go, and as we go now, we'd like to get a close-up view of Mission Control, the so-called MOKER, the Mission Operations Control Center. My colleague, correspondent Steve Young, is inside. Reed, Mission Control is not in blackout, but it is in semi-darkness. The four ranks of consoles and people working behind them are staring intently at the two central ida fours, the television projection screens. The one on the right-hand side is a rectangular grid pattern. It denotes the energy that's being expended by the spacecraft as it enters. And to the left on the central ida four, the uh, intended course bearing when they get a fix on Columbia, as it gets a little closer, they'll start projecting the actual course over what was anticipated and what they wanted. Of course, they can't see or talk to it, but they can see it in a way with C-band radar, and they're tracking it. We just got a report they're about 188,000 feet up now. They were, as we know, 150-some statute miles above the Earth within this very hour. They lost very, very little speed if you consider they were traveling at 16.5 thousand miles an hour. They took about 250 miles an hour off of that, and that was enough to bring them home. In approximately one minute and 15 seconds, we should be able to hear our first words from them as they approach the verge of the shores of California and begin to streak in over the Mojave Desert and head themselves on to Edwards Air Force Base. 
It doesn't take long once they get in that last 11-minute period that they're still traveling almost 9,000 miles an hour. Let's listen. Well, stand by. Mark. That's keying in mission control. Chase copy. A chase plane is being contacted now. The voice of Jack Riley here in mission control telling us the aviation system look good. Look good. We're about 25 miles south of the nominal ground track. From you, Houston, through Buckhorn, configure AOS. You're about 25 miles south of ground track. Your nav is good. Your energy is good. We'd like you to check your TACAN, MLS, and radar altimeters on. Over. Okay, we concur with that, Joe. And did you get my call on the nav aid? Okay, we got the call on the nav aid. That's Rick Howell. Roger, Houston everything's control. looking good. Your energy is very good. The nav is good. Out of 154,000 at 9.8. Let's compare that scene now and Steve Young. We've, uh, in the last couple of minutes, uh, dramatically, the two Ida fours that everyone's been watching have indicated that the vertical descent appears to be right on the money. A yellow track is now tracing its way slowly down the center red line, which had been the path they wanted to show for the uh, profile. It's right on the money. But on the Ida four to the left, you've been hearing some reference to the uh, spacecraft coming in a little bit south. And indeed, you see a 360-degree presentation in blue, a kind of a S squirrel in red. That was the course they wanted them to take. And the yellow falling line, which is emerging, indicating the actual path of the spacecraft, is uh, from this distance maybe a foot below what was wished for, which means uh, in uh, actual distance about 25 miles south. Slowly, these little lines are crawling across the graph, but uh, no one is indicating here or anything, but uh, it looks pretty nominal. Out of 100, and we'll continue with the flight, the return of Shuttle 2 in a minute. Roger. If you've been putting money aside, you can almost see inflation eroding its buying power, unless it's earning high interest rates or substantial dividends. And right now, thanks to Dreyfus Liquid Assets, even a small investment can profit from the currently high interest rates with complete cash availability. Think of your Dreyfus Liquid Assets account as an income-earning investment with free checking privileges. Privileges that allow you to pay bills and still earn money till the check's clear. You can even withdraw all or part of your cash by phone. There's never a penalty, never a sales or withdrawal charge. To get all the details, call toll-free 800 228 5,000 for a simple no jargon information booklet and a prospectus including management fee, charges, and expenses. Find out how Dreyfus Liquid Assets helps you get the lion's share from today's high interest rates. Read the prospectus carefully before you invest. 800-228-5000. No charge for the call. 800-228-5000. Call now. And the flight of Shuttle 2 continues to go well as it nears Edwards Air Force Base, having re-entered less than an hour ago and having flown all the way across the Pacific Ocean. It soon should be within sight of the thousands of people out there at Edwards. Let's listen for an emission control. They're trying to take out about a 25-mile south error in the entry point, which is not serious. Okay, Houston, PTR 2 at Mark 58, Mark. Uh, Roger, we show you now out of uh, 120,000 feet, 5.6 miles. Okay, I'm configuring the flashy baps. Roger. Flashy baps that cool the craft. It's been awfully hot outside, but it's been about 86 degrees inside. Team Valley now, nine minutes away from landing. 115,000 feet, Mach 5.3, range 148 miles. She's still traveling some four times the speed of sound. Big Sur up to the north, Vandenberg down to the south, as they rip in over the coastline of California. 110,000 feet. Okay, roll reversal right at 4-8. Roger. Roll reversal over where else, California. 
left roll reversal now at 108,000. Range 125 miles, Mach 4.5. Still four and a half times the speed of sound. But an airplane now, capable of flight in the oceans of air. CTI-2, Mark. Roger. And that was PTI-3, Rick, sorry about that. Roger. That was a big one, and it was completed by a 405. Okay, we can turn. Voices from the coming aircraft, in Columbia now. That's flying like a plane. 102,000 feet altitude. Range 96. Edwards has acquis visual acquisition on TV. Out of 100,000 feet, Mark 3.6. You have positive seats. Uh, Rick, you're a little uh, curve there. If you could say again, the boats are coming out now at 3.4. And say again, your last. Positive seats. They could get out if they had to now by the old means of leaving a positive seat from you now. That's four, Mark. Roger. Let's go back to our vantage point now at Edwards uh, Air Force Base in California, the target point of all of this, and David Dow. David, can you see her yet? At a range of 74 miles. We can't, cannot see it yet, Reed, but the uh, television cameras posted out on the hills, east or west, rather, of here, have acquired it. The uh, chase planes are now uh, maneuvering to uh, rendezvous with the shuttle. The shuttle, of course, at this stage is dropping very, very fast, looting, losing altitude and speed very, very fast. And uh, the cameras continue to follow it. It's a uh, little more than a blip on the screens at this stage, but uh, progressing, speeding very rapidly and, and slowing uh, as it approaches us. So we should be able to see it fairly soon. Is the wind blowing out there, David? What's the weather like as she comes on down? The wind the wind continues to blow. If anything, it's uh, continuing to pick up slightly. It's quite brisk. In fact, a couple of hats went just went sailing by me here from a uh, uh, cameraman uh, who had to forsake them uh, or forsake their posts. Well, there should be a lot of hats in the air in a lot of places if this thing works as planned as she's hurtling on down. Right on the money there, Joe, and we have a wind update for you and a weather update. Uh, you've got a very thin layer at 25,000. The wind's Airborne are as briefed and on the ground at 220, 18 knots, gusting to 24. Altimeter is 30, decimal 07. You got 60 miles viz underneath. Over. Very good. Sound like a good old any day. Yes, sir. Still hurtling along, we estimate that uh, out of 68,000 coming through 70,000 feet. 39 miles range, Mach 1.5. PTI 6, Mark. Reed, Joe Engel, of course, uh, knows the runways out here almost as well as anyone, having landed here many, many times. We are uh, continuing to fly the test maneuvers. Including 16 times with uh, an X-15 rocket flight. Well, he's been to the fringe of space enough, really, to qualify as an astronaut if you if you count as high 60, as he's gone. That is correct. As they come into the 50,000 foot altitude at about Mach 1, or at the speed of sound, they'll deactivate all the RCS yaw thrusters that have been able to control the plane, and then they'll be almost totally an aircraft. CGI 7, Mark. My hut. Reed, we are now seeing the contrail overhead of the shuttle, one. well overhead. Range 27 miles. We should be hearing a sonic boom very soon. It is uh, the shuttle now descending through the area. Mark. Roger, you're tracking right down the line. And descending very rapidly out over the desert, preparing to make that we we'll approaching the heading alignment circle. We hear the sonic booms, two rapid-fire booms like 42,000 shot. feet. The shuttle Mark is now below the speed of sound. Miles range. Heading toward that U-turn out over the tower, four on, reminder, you've got the strong northeast of here. Now out of, 
out of 38,000 feet. Okay, thank you, Rick. David, they have strong winds from the west, so I suppose that means they're going to have a tailwind coming in. That would give them a Roger. little bit of an unusual experience that uh, Shuttle 1 didn't have. Well, the winds are not directly up the runway. They, uh, they're they not a crosswind exactly, but uh, they are not uh, directly with the runway. I'll be making a wide sweeping turn now get lined up with the runway. Good television picture. 25,000 feet. I'm in Houston about 3,000 feet low now out of 24,000 feet. Look at that. Columbia now descending about seven times more rapidly than uh, a commercial airliner making its rep average landing. Still on its turn. The chase planes have it well in sight. From six times the speed of sound to 280 knots, about 300 miles an hour in less than 200 miles. That's deceleration. Looking okay. We now have a beautiful view of the orbiter descending one of the chase planes to its left, below it. That's where these television pictures that we're seeing to our right are coming from. So far, a near rerun of last spring's first landing of the shuttle. Commander Engel has a go for auto land. In other words, he will go into the automatic landing system. He is, in effect, electronically linked to the Earth with the microwave scan beam system, this elaborate uh, last word in electronic landing systems, especially devised for this procedure. Check he is at this off. point, in effect, hands off. David, I think, at least truly gets to put the landing gear down. That's one of the few manual things that are done, and that's not done until one of the last minutes of the flight. The flight plan, Reed, called for Engel to actually take... Uh, uh, the manufacturer doesn't like to call it manual control, control stick steering, but in effect, manual control of the craft at about 1,800 feet altitude during the closing seconds of the landing process. As we said, everything seems to be a near rerun, at least uh, visually, uh, of last spring's first landing of Columbia. Mission Control here, of course, sees on their monitors uh, what these chase planes are able to develop in terms of a uh, picture. And uh, there, at Edwards, you should be able to eyeball her in by now, David. She must be pretty close. She is descending very rapidly now. Indeed, we are eyeballing her in. Again, descending seven times at the rate of a okay. commercial airliner making landing. Settling now, just about ready to flare out. Three down. Within seconds, the nose will come up at a 22 degree 100. angle. 100. 100 feet over the deck now. 20, 10, Five, three, touchdown. She is down. Was she is down. The first spacecraft to go into Ten. space a second time and return to Earth. Ten. Down, apparently a beautiful landing Five. with dust flaring out three. behind it. Touchdown. Welcome home. Thank you, Chase. A, a beautiful landing. <laughs> Applause all around us here. VIP zone right behind us, thousands of people looking on. This is shuttle control. The unofficial touchdown time and mission elapsed time is two days, six hours, 13 minutes, 10 seconds. That's about a minute, 10 seconds beyond what they had figured it would be yesterday, which is uh, not bad, as they say, for government work. 
After two days and uh, six hours plus in space, uh, as near to perfect as you could make it practically. The shuttle now continuing to roll out along this desert lake bed. And now like a swarm of ants, the recovery team moving across the desert toward Columbia, 18 or so vehicles, closing in on Columbia, like ants closing in on a dead beetle, as someone put it once. A big wind machine such as that used by California citrus growers to uh, keep their crops from being frostbitten. The big snorkels that will be used to purge Columbia of the any toxic gases it might have uh, collected on the way down. Well, that's the scene as uh, David Dow described it as the big bird comes lumbering in for a landing a little more than a minute late than the predicted touchdown time was at Mission Control here in Houston yesterday. A wonderful sight, uh, as we have commented before, almost a mirror image with a little different topography of the first landing, which also was on the 14th of another month, that being back in April. Now the long procedure of getting the astronauts out of the craft and getting the craft itself made safe will begin, and we'll continue with our safe return of the flight of Shuttle 2 after this. If you've been reading about wise money management in your favorite publications, you've undoubtedly heard about Dreyfus Liquid Assets, one of the world's largest money market funds, and about the big yields you can get on your money right now. Start with as little as $2,500. Make added investments as low as $100. With Dreyfus Liquid Assets, your money is yours whenever you need it. Phone for it, have it sent to your bank, or write a redemption check for cash or to pay your larger bills. You keep right on earning that high yield, compounded daily until your check clears. No penalties on interest, no sales charge, no charge for the checks. It's so simple, sensible, convenient. But find out for yourself. Call toll-free 800-228-5000 for free information and a prospectus, including management fee, charges, and expenses. Read the prospectus carefully before investing or sending money. Discover how Dreyfus Liquid Assets can help you get the lion's share of today's high money market rates. 800-228-5000. Toll free. 800-228-5000. Just three minutes, 45 seconds ago, the old spacecraft Columbia completed its first up and down voyage. Not as long as they would have liked it to have been, but... Uh, a little more than two days and six hours and 13 minutes from liftoff to landing, a safe landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Angle and truly now going through the post-landing uh, checklist, which is a voluminous a series of, of books and checks and things to do. There are some 14,000 switches in, in front of them and below them and around them in that spacecraft, which still looks like an airplane, but still lands pretty hard and pretty fast. Something like a, getting the spacecraft out of the idea seems a little bit hard to do. Anyway, she's down. They're safe. They'll be inside for some time if experience is the rule. In Mission Control, my colleague Steve Young could tell us, I believe, Steve, what it's been like. Well, we there are about 100, 150 people in the VIP viewing room, and there are about uh, 200 or 300 eyes uh, glued to TV sets in that area. And now, in the front of Mission Control, some of the uh, picture from out in California has been put up in the place of uh, where there was technical data. You know, the fuel cell problem caused the flight to be truncated, of course, and top management here said it was uh, the prudent thing to bring them back early. They weren't alarmed. Well, that uh, prudent attitude uh, continued right through the end. When the uh, shuttle touched down, the VIP started applauding. But Gene Kranz and Christopher Kraft, the director of the Johnson Space Center, didn't applaud until the nose wheel came down. That's when they started applauding. It's interesting. They have a couple of acronyms that you can add to your space uh, dictionary if you want to. Touchdown is known as weight on wheels. That, of course, is wow. A little bit later, when the nose gear touches down, it is called weight on nose gear, which is wong. So you have wow and you have wong. And when you have wong, you're just about 
wound up as far as the space flight's safe return is concerned, although there is considerable roll on all three of the gear. So the flight that began with uh, a little bit of difficulty and encountered a little bit of difficulty as it got airborne with the loss of one fuel cell, which, by the way, has been safely maintained aboard the craft and will be the subject of intensive examination. The flight has ended at Edwards Air Force Base with what the officials have called a minimum mission, that is, a duration time of some 54 hours, not the five days and four hours that Engel and Truly were aiming for, but two days and six hours and about 13 minutes, which they settled for and which mission control and all connected with this space flight, this epic-making second voyage of a Columbia, which everybody has been more than satisfied with, with a safe return of Engel and Truly, a nominal return to Earth. This is Reed Collins, CBS News at the Johnson Space Center.